Hey everyone, and welcome to more D&D Horror Stories. In today's episode, we have a tale about a dungeon master that gets a little too into an NPC, a story about a player that has a strange obsession, and more. But first, this chart shows that some of you that watch the videos aren't yet subscribed, so I hope I can earn your subscription today. And to help in that endeavor, here are some kitties. Now, let's get right into these stories. DM Slowly has made the entire campaign revolve around their DMPC. By Reddit user, Activating EMP. Been playing a campaign for a bit now with a novice DM, a friend of mine, which was originally intended to be a classic save the world adventure at the beginning of the campaign, dealing with an undead scourge and the king of it with assistance from some of the NPCs of the world. This campaign is riddled with flaws too long to discuss in this post, but the issue that has become the most important to me is the all-consuming presence of the DMPC introduced early on. Originally, the DMPC was met as a male warlock who was just traveling along with us to help us, appointed to the party by some other important NPCs. Later, down the line, this character was retconned to be female, and brought the entire party back to life after a TPK. This DMPC, over the course of many sessions, is shown to be an immortal with the powers over life and death, and knows every high-ranking NPC in every country on a personal level, and with extremely high combat power. The DMPC is even close friends with the personification of death. Obviously, this leaves many of our player characters wondering why we even need to be here to save the world if the DMPC is essentially all-powerful. As the sessions have continued to progress, the DM always manages to pull focus onto their DMPC over and over. Every single character in this universe knows and loves this DMPC, and any time that we are involved with something in an area with the DMPC around, they resolve any issues Several times, we would be fighting something, only for the DMPC to suddenly start participating at the end of the fight and one-shot the enemy. Sessions where the DMPC has not been present have been lore domes of the DMPC's lore, or will have a relative that has a nearly identical name who also happens to be immortal, and the DM will make sure that we know they are strong and cool, and that we should definitely like them. The current plotline involves finding copies of the DMPC and attempting to reunite them, with the original Undead Scourge going unmentioned for about 15 sessions or more at this point. Obviously, me and my fellow PCs are not having a good time with this. We have mentioned that the original plotline has been abandoned several times now, but gotten no justification for it. If this wasn't bad enough, this DM literally plays this character in another campaign that I'm in. He seems obsessed with this character, and I don't know how to tell him that I hope I never see this character another time in my life. In character, last session, we were asked what we think of the DMPC, and all but one of the players roasted the hell out of it. So, maybe the DM has already gotten the message. Ah, the classic tale of the all-powerful DMPC. I know that there are a lot of people out there that are completely against DMPCs in general, and while I can partially see where they're coming from, especially with stories like this out there, I think that DMPCs can be a good thing in games. They just need to be done right, and not with a DM that wants them to be the star of the show. If it's a character that pops up every now and then to interact and occasionally help the party in a fight, without being a deus ex machina, I think that they are totally fine. Though, it sounds like this DM just wanted to take a character from another game and make her the star of the show. And when you have a character like that, it leaves the players with no sense of challenge or accomplishment. Let's move on. How I got tricked into siding with a toxic GM. Submitted to the D&D Doe subreddit by Reddit user Gel the Pyro. My former GM, let's call him Larry, had an amazing campaign I played for over a year. My favorite character I've ever played made it from Session 1 to the epic finale that just could not have been better, going from level 3 all the way to 20 in just about a real life year. 
We become friends on Discord at the beginning of the campaign, which is where we held online sessions, and there were no red flags of any kind. I later tried GMing Curse of Strahd for the group, and his character had this thing. He'd prepare NPCs to fight Strahd by strangling them. I thought it made sense. Larry knew vampires bite necks. But the very first red flag was, he only did it to the young female NPCs and kept asking their ages. But he had great roleplay otherwise, so I ignored it. I then, for the first time, played a female character at his table, and he asked for a session zero. It had amazing backstory incorporation, friendly NPCs, and great character moments. But then he spent half the campaign with my 77-year-old elf being choked. The setting was a magic high school, so I was a teenager in elf years. Larry assures me that he did this to everyone, and it was just to create danger a level 1 sorcerer could handle herself. The other players blew up at him for being a creep, and I thought that they were overreacting, until I heard what he did in the session that I missed. He choked five underage girls, and nobody else. I am convinced that the only reason Larry didn't choke the little girl in the Curse of Strahd campaign is that he never got a chance to. I still love that first campaign, but knowing who was running it tainted the experience. I am now remembering that a lot of the female players left. They never blew up at him, but now I can't stop thinking that Larry was probably choking their player characters. I have since left, and the other players who left formed a separate group and tried running a game. It fell apart, but no D&D is better than bad D&D. Hopefully, my next group will have even better adventures than Larry's first campaign. Some other red flags that don't fit elsewhere. I forgot to mention the time he tried to force me to play a cleric that had to be 100% loyal to my deity and couldn't do anything that they didn't deem acceptable, even after I explained my experience with religion. I won't go too much into detail, but I had a friend who became ill and wasn't allowed to go to school because his mom was Christian and she couldn't let her boys be exposed to the evils of vaccines and the theory of evolution. It's stuff like this that makes me never want to return to church. If you want to read the story on the channel, you can, but only if you give the like and comment kitties their treats. I'm not usually one to dunk on whatever proclivities someone might have, but that one is a bit much especially when you try to roleplay it out in tabletop RPGs on unsuspecting players. Hopefully, Larry will keep that to himself in the future, and we don't see a Netflix documentary in a few years called The D&D Strangler. Oh, and about the treats. If that treat had a like button, Lucky would click it. But let's get into the final story of the day. New DM can't say no to problem players, and half the party quits. By Reddit user, Socialist Alpaca. This happened a few years ago. I was trying to introduce my girlfriend to D&D, and after a few one-on-one -on -one sessions with her, where I had explained the rules and made her play some light-hearted fantasy shenanigans, she told me she felt ready to play in a real campaign with other people. Being the forever DM in my group, and wanting to play alongside my girlfriend, I tried to find someone willing to DM to us, but came up empty-handed, even after months of trying to find people interested. Then, out of the blue, my girlfriend told me that she had found out that one of her university colleagues played D&D regularly with a group of players, and... After some time discussing, it turned out he had always wanted to DM a big campaign and had plans to start a new group. The DM, being a good guy, although really shy, something that will be important later, tells us we can join. We are happy and start building our characters and writing some background ideas, since we were told we would be playing in the Forgotten Realms and that he could make basically any background work with what he had in mind. Session 1 comes and we find out the exact composition of our newfound group. Introducing Me, Tepest Cleric Girlfriend, Archfey Warlock An open-hand monk A blood hunter I don't remember which specific subclass And a devotion paladin 
I will refer to them as their respective class from now on to avoid confusion. Monk is a friend of ours who got invited to the campaign, a generally chill dude and a good player who had a lot of sessions under his belt. The juicy part starts now. Before the session starts, we chill and chat with our newfound party members and we find out that Bloodhunter is a good friend of DM's and that Paladin is actually DM's dungeon master in their respective game. We are just now told that this game is basically a spin-off sequel of their own campaign and that, for shits and giggles, Bloodhunter will be playing a mixture of Geralt from The Witcher and Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, and that Paladin will be playing Barum from League of Legends. This puts a bad taste in my mouth, but being the first time I had the occasion to play in a long time, let alone the fact that this was my girlfriend's first ever time playing with strangers, I didn't want to ruin her excitement, so I took a deep breath and decided to see where this was going. The campaign was pretty straightforward and a kinda nice concept. We played a few centuries after a demon army had swept through the Forgotten Realms. This army had been defeated by Blood Hunters and DM's previous characters in another session. The soul of the Demon King was then split into four parts and put into four MacGuffins in which we had the quest to retrieve them before an evil cult was able to collect them all and evoke Asmodeus once again. I'll have to summarize a full year of sparse sessions and horror events. 1. Immediately, the Paladin elects himself as the leader of the group. He is often hostile and very difficult to talk to. He is also really jealous of my character, the Tempest Cleric, and gets really nervous every time I manage to outdamage him in combat. 2. Bloodhunter is the epitome of edginess and lone wolfness. He gets confrontative very fast and often resorts to paralyzing anyone and everything that gets in his way. This includes innocent bystanders and my girlfriend's character. 3. Me, Girlfriend, and Monk are treated as Class B players. Paladin and Bloodhunter are the real protagonists of this story. Paladin has 50,000 gold pieces, a plus 3 weapon, plus 3 shield, and plus 3 armor for his mount. We are level 5. Bloodhunter has a magic, although cursed, sword, which sorta of lets him become a demon from time to time. Bloodhunter is a prince from a faraway land, and Paladin is the king of a small nautical kingdom. 4. Both Paladin and Bloodhunter cheat constantly. Paladin somehow has 20 constitution and 24 strength at 5th level, and we caught Bloodhunter using loaded dice after rolling 6 or 7 natural 20s in a row. Both admitted to cheating for shits and giggles and toned it down, but never stopped. This gets worse. Introducing Bladesinger. Bladesinger joins the campaign after a year. Bladesinger also played in DM's original campaign and is also a game master for another session that the DM, Bladesinger, Paladin, and Bloodhunter are playing in. He comes to the first session in cosplay, cape, pointy ears, flasks, books, and all, and explains how he likes to roleplay more than anything, and that he wanted to play a lawful good bladesinger who is a harpist. Harpists in Forgotten Realms are a good secret society who generally help people and tries to maintain order and peace. Being somewhat relieved by hearing that, but very worried about his relationship with the rest of the players, we begin what would be our last session. The game starts, and Bladesinger immediately tries to kill Bloodhunter for no reason, by spam casting Toll the Dead. He can't hit him though, because I had cast Sanctuary on him. He gets hostile in character, and then in real life, threatening me to drop concentration on Sanctuary. I tell him that the next spell I see him cast, that I'll just channel Divinity called Lightning on him. He laughs, saying that he can't kill Bloodhunter in the main session, so he just wants to kill him in this spinoff. We drag through the rest of the game, which had us find out crazy stuff about Paladins and Bloodhunter's backgrounds, some sort of they are the chosen ones, powerful sons of demons and not really human, but constructs made in humans' images, yada yada yada. Me, Girlfriend, and Monk talk after the game, and the conversation goes like this. So, 
Do we want to quit? Yeah. Yes. We told DM that that was our last session, and we quit. We never played again with that DM or his three friends, but I still play with Girlfriend and Monk. I remember feeling extra guilty towards Girlfriend, as I thought this experience had ruined D&D for her. Luckily, she understood the situation, and this didn't ruin the hobby for any of us. What bugs me the most is the fact that DM asked me for advice constantly at the end of each session, and proceeding to ignore it every time, since it didn't feel right towards Paladin and Bloodhunter, and he played with them in other sessions and didn't want to cause trouble. Ultimately, he was so non-confrontational that anything went at his table. As far as I know, he still plays with Bladesinger, Paladin, and Bloodhunter, and they still sabotage his sessions for shits and giggles. Unfortunately, stories like this are far too common. Pushover DM has immature friends in his game and proceeds to give them special treatment and lets them get away with anything. At least they were able to finally see the situation for what it was and decide to leave, as it sounds like the same things were still happening. I'm glad to hear that this experience didn't ruin D&D for any of the innocent players, and hopefully they can find a decent table to play at again, this time with a decent DM. And that's all for today. If you have a story that you would like to be featured on the channel, be sure to post it to the D&D Dose subreddit, or link it in the comments. Also be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I post stuff, but honestly, mostly cats. As always, I appreciate all of you, and may all of your roles be natural 20s. Until next time.